Magnetism explained, the hidden order of nature by augmented Newtonian dynamics. Magnetism has always held a mysterious fascination for humankind. For centuries people have asked, what is magnetism? What hidden forces give rise to it, and how is it sustained? From the earliest times, children and adults alike have marveled at the invisible pull of a magnet, as if it possessed some secret power. Historically, the story begins with naturally occurring magnetic stones, known as lodestones or magnetite. These curious rocks could attract bits of iron and even influence direction, leading to their use in some of the earliest compasses. Yet despite their long history, the true nature of magnetism has remained one of science's most enduring puzzles. The earliest and perhaps most remarkable use of magnetism comes from ancient China. Historical evidence suggests that more than 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, the Chinese had already discovered how magnets could guide direction. They fashioned simple compasses by suspending a piece of lodestone so that it could freely align with the Earth's magnetic field. These early instruments were not used for navigation at sea, as in later centuries, but for harmonizing buildings, rituals, and journeys in accordance with principles of balance and orientation of the feng shui system. Long before the Western world adopted the compass, the Chinese had unlocked one of the most practical and enduring applications of magnetism. Lodestones were not found everywhere, but only in certain regions, which made them all the more mysterious. In Greece, one of the places where these curious stones were discovered was the region of Magnesia, in Thessaly. From this location comes the very word magnet, derived from the Greek mags lithos, meaning the stone from Magnesia. To the ancients, these rocks seemed to possess magical powers, they could attract iron without touch and cling to it as if alive. Beyond their fascination, lodestones may also have served a practical role, because they are naturally magnetized forms of iron or magnetite, their presence could indicate the location of larger underground deposits of iron. In this way, they may have acted as nature's signposts, pointing early societies to valuable resources long before the techniques of mining and geology were formalized. But how did these natural magnets in the Earth's crust come into being? It turns out that for the force of magnetism to be present, whether in a natural lodestone or in a laboratory-made magnet, the iron compound must be exposed to electricity for a sustained period of time. In nature, the only source of such powerful electricity is lightning. Thus, the formation of lodestones likely required very specific conditions, large deposits of iron-bearing rock lying close to the Earth's surface, in regions of plentiful rainfall and frequent thunderstorms. Each lightning strike would send a surge of electrical energy through the iron deposits, gradually aligning the magnetic domains within the rock. Over time, this repeated exposure transformed ordinary magnetite into the rare and remarkable natural magnets that so astonished ancient peoples. It can now be understood that the very existence of permanent magnetism, in any form, is proof that the material has at some point interacted with an electric current. Without this electrical influence, permanent magnetism cannot arise. To understand how augmented Newtonian dynamics views magnetism, we must first examine the structure of metals, particularly their crystalline lattice. The atomic arrangement within a metal forms what is called a crystal structure, a periodic arrangement of points in space about which atoms are positioned. This three-dimensional repeating array is known as a space lattice, and it can be described in terms of its smallest repeating unit, the unit cell. When extended indefinitely, the unit cell generates the entire lattice. Mathematicians and crystallographers have shown that there are only 14 unique ways of arranging such points in three dimensions. These are called the brevet lattices, and they fall into seven crystal systems, cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, trigonal, and hexagonal. With the development of X-ray crystallography, exploiting the fact that X-ray wavelengths are of the same order of magnitude as the spacing of atoms in crystals, scientists were able to probe these structures with great precision. It was discovered that many metals prefer the cubic system, which provides both strength and stability. Among all of the crystal structures, the face-centered cubic, FCC, lattice stands out for its ability to conduct electricity. The FCC arrangement places atoms at each corner of a cube and at the center of each face. This geometry is exceptionally efficient. It packs atoms together very closely, with a packing efficiency of about 74%, the highest possible for spheres. Because of this close packing, the outer electrons of these atoms overlap strongly, creating a sea of delocalized or free electrons that can move through the lattice with minimal resistance. This is why the four best electrical conductors, silver, copper, gold, and aluminum, all crystallize in the FCC structure. 
Each atom contributes one or more valence electrons to the conduction band. In FCC metals, these conduction electrons move easily because 1. The lattice is symmetrical and dense, reducing scattering of electrons. 2. The high coordination number, 12 nearest neighbors per atom, means electronic orbitals overlap extensively. 3. The result is a broad, continuous conduction band where electrons behave almost like free particles. Thus, the FCC lattice provides both structural stability and maximum electron mobility, the two essential ingredients for excellent electrical conductivity. The simple cubic, SC, structure is the most basic of all crystal arrangements. Atoms are positioned only at the eight corners of the cube, with each atom effectively shared between eight neighboring unit cells. This results in a very low packing efficiency of only about 52%, meaning nearly half the volume of the crystal is empty space. Each atom in a simple cubic lattice has just six nearest neighbors, one along each axis direction. Because the atoms are relatively far apart and their orbitals overlap only weakly, very few electrons become delocalized to form a conduction band. For this reason, the SC structure is mechanically weak, relatively unstable, and very poor for conducting electricity. In fact, among the elements, only polonium crystallizes naturally in the simple cubic form. The body-centered cubic, BCC, structure places atoms at each corner of the cube, with one additional atom in the very center. This makes it more stable than the simple cubic arrangement, and it packs more efficiently, with a packing efficiency of about 68%. Each atom in a BCC lattice has eight nearest neighbors, compared to 12 in the more efficient FCC lattice. This lower coordination means that the atomic orbitals overlap less extensively, which in turn reduces the density of free electrons in the conduction band. As a result, metals with a BCC structure, such as iron, tungsten, and chromium, are mechanically strong but not the best conductors of electricity. In the case of iron, the BCC structure has another important consequence, the lower packing density leaves more open space between atoms. These gaps provide pathways for oxygen and water molecules to diffuse into the lattice, making iron especially prone to oxidation. When exposed to air and moisture, iron atoms at the surface react with oxygen to form iron oxides, the familiar reddish-brown coating of rust. Thus, while BCC iron is strong and versatile, its structure explains both its mediocre electrical conductivity and its unfortunate tendency to corrode. The ability of a crystal to conduct electricity depends not only on its lattice type, but also on the purity of that lattice. In a perfect crystal, such as pure copper, silver, or gold, the atoms are arranged in a highly regular pattern, and the conduction electrons flow almost unhindered through the lattice, scattering only rarely. This is why these pure FCC metals are superb conductors. When foreign atoms are introduced, however, the story changes. The presence of impurities distorts the crystal lattice, creating irregularities that disrupt the smooth flow of electrons. Each impurity acts like a tiny obstacle, scattering electrons and reducing conductivity. This is why steel, which is primarily iron with a small percentage of carbon atoms inserted into its lattice, is mechanically stronger but a much poorer conductor of electricity than pure iron. The carbon atoms distort the BCC lattice of iron, interrupting electron pathways. In general, the greater the purity and the more regular the lattice, the better the conduction. Conversely, alloys and impure crystals, while often mechanically stronger, pay the price in terms of electrical performance. This fundamental trade-off between strength and conductivity is one of the key principles in material science. The study of crystalline structures revealed why some metals conduct electricity so well. In the same way, it also helps us understand why only a handful of elements exhibit strong ferromagnetism. The essential requirement is that the atoms possess unpaired valence electrons, as in iron, cobalt, and nickel, where the 3D orbitals are not completely filled. When two neighboring atoms each carry such unpaired electrons, their spins interact. Instead of cancelling, they prefer to align in the same direction, a tendency reinforced by the geometry of the crystal lattice. In the framework of augmented Newtonian dynamics, this alignment takes on a deeper meaning. Each electron is constantly regulating its energy through the emission and immediate reabsorption of virtual photons. In an ordered lattice such as BCC iron or FCC cobalt and nickel, the photon exchanges of neighboring electrons do not remain isolated. They become coupled, because the repeating geometry of the lattice forces electrons into stable, periodic positions. In this arrangement, unpaired electrons are free to lock into step, their photon regulation cycles reinforcing one another rather than conflicting. The result is the emergence of magnetic domains, vast regions of atoms whose valence electrons are aligned in a single orientation. In ordinary matter, these domains point in random directions, cancelling one another. But under the right conditions, or when influenced by an external field, the domains swing into alignment, and a powerful permanent magnet is born. 
Thus, in an theory, ferromagnetism is not a mysterious property of a few elements, but the natural outcome of electron self-stabilization, lattice order, and the cooperative coupling of unpaired valence electrons. Having explained the root of magnetism in crystal lattices and valence electron spin, we now turn to electricity in conductors. Neutrality is fundamental in nature, even the gain or loss of a single electron disturbs balance. In a metal conductor, the scene is already chaotic. At room temperature, electrons rush about at nearly a million meters per second, colliding constantly. Into this restless sea, and theory introduces a key insight. The moment a potential difference appears across a conductor, free electrons emit the lowest energy quanta they can, conduction photons. By the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, these photons exist only fleetingly, about 1 0 to the power of 1 seconds, before they must be reabsorbed. Often the same electron cannot reabsorb its own photon and instead captures one from a neighbor. The original photon loops outward and back, seeking resolution. When this happens, the virtual photon ether aligns along the escaping photon's path, forming continuous lines. These are the familiar magnetic field loops around a current-carrying wire. Each line of force represents photons connected in series, carrying the energy of a single conduction photon, about one electron volt. In and theory, the lines of force that surround a magnet include not only photons exchanged within the lattice but also those that leave the conductor and loop back in again. These escaping conduction photons are crucial because they interact with the virtual photon ether, which aligns along their paths to form the extended loops of force we observe outside the magnet. Inside the material, domains act as reservoirs of free electrons, constantly emitting conduction photons that sustain these loops. But it is not a perfect duplication where each electron endlessly emits and reabsorbs the same photon in strict sequence. Instead, there are gaps and substitutions. One electron may emit, another may reabsorb, and photons may travel out of the conductor and return. What results is a system that, though built on chaotic motion, emulates continuity and maintains the magnetic field in a steady, constant form. Thus, magnetism is not static clockwork but a living equilibrium, stabilized by millions of photon exchanges inside the material and countless photon loops outside. This explains why the magnetic field is both robust and enduring, yet rooted in the restless activity of electrons and photons and exists even after the current source has been removed, the lines of force are self-sustaining because the lines of force are replenished and completed by free electrons within the domains of the magnet.